On the island of Hawaii, the prevailing winds blow from the east. But on the island of Vancouver, the prevailing winds blow from the west. If a huge rainstorm is located just to the east of Hawaii, then grab your umbrella because in a few hours you will be getting wet. But if a huge rainstorm is located just to the east of Vancouver and the sky to the west is sunny, then you know that sunny weather is coming. To understand why these global weather patterns exist, it helps to know something about spinning. Getting the ball into the basket when we're sitting still is easy, but when we're spinning, it becomes impossible. I'm Science Mom. I'm Math Dad. And it might seem like we're just goofing around spinning on this carousel, but if you understand why this happens, then you'll better understand why the deserts on our planet all occur at the same latitude. Welcome! You can see from our background that we are in a rather tropical location right now. Indeed. Well, actually, we're still in our garage, and that's why we have on sweaters, because it's cold in our garage. But our background is tropical because today we're going to learn why the equator is so warm. First, I want to give a real quick welcome and shout out to those who are watching us live. Hello to Ember, Logan, Kyle, and Paige watching from California, Cassidy from Mississippi, Grace, Evelyn, Olivia, and Aubrey from Minnesota, Emily from Colorado, Elizabeth and Sam from Cincinnati, and Victor watching in Belgium, and many, many more. Welcome to everybody, and special welcome to you if you're watching our recording. So to explain why the equator is so warm, I'm going to make a cup of tea. Is it because they make a lot of tea at the equator and all the heat makes the earth warm there? No, it is no. not. So I had a tea bag. I'm opening my tea bag up. I'm going to now dump all the tea out in here. Hold that for me, Math Dad. All right, I'm watching. She's wasting the tea. Or... No, no, I've, I've got it all in there. And now I have some hot water and I'm going to pour it through the coffee filter. And that's why the earth is warm. Kids! Oh! So sorry, <laughs> Math Dad. Okay. <laughs> that was an unintentional mess. I didn't, I thought it would travel through a lot easier. <laughs> but the real reason that we made tea is so I could get this empty tea bag. Because now that I have an empty tea bag, you ready, Math Dad? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't do this at home, kids. <laughs> now that I have an empty tea bag, we can learn why the equator is so warm. And it all has to do with what happens if I light this tea bag on fire. That's why the equator is warm? It, it will all make sense oh. in just a moment. You ready? No, I lost it. I lost it. Watch closely. The tea bag is starting to burn and it's going down lower and lower. Is this safe science, mom? This is actually a lot safer than it looks. <gasps> what the? Did you see that? It like floated up into the air. It lifted up into the air. And the reason it lifted up is because hot air rises. And okay. hot air rising is the reason why our equator is so warm. We have a video clip where you can see this floating tea bag trick just a little bit better, and I'm going to explain how it works while we play it. Math Dad, apologies again about the tea that spilled that's right. everywhere. That's pretty warm tea there. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, the water in the thermos had cooled down, so it was warm, but not like boiling warm. All right, here we go. I am lighting the tea bag on fire, and as it starts to burn, you can see that it, the flame is going down, and our tea bag is getting lighter because a lot of it is being converted into carbon dioxide and water vapor. And once it gets light enough, then the hot air that is rising up carries the tea bag up into the air. And what you end up with is just this tiny little thing of, of soot, essentially. So all the way to the ceiling. Yeah. That's super impressive. This this one didn't go very high, but No, it got a little wet because of our accident. <laughs> <laughs> so like, it didn't it didn't float up quite as high. But hot air rises, and this is the main reason why the equator is so warm because we live on a round planet. And our round planet, the equator is closest to the sun. So as sunlight is traveling from the sun and then hits our planet, the equator is the most warm because it is getting most of the radiation. And there are two reasons for that. One, 
it's actually literally closer to the sun than other parts of our planet. And two, the sunlight does not have to travel through as much atmosphere. Oh no, math dad, my, did my papers get wet? I have no idea what papers you're going to. Oh, it, just imagine that you have a curve and you can see sunlight going through the curve at the equator. It just has to travel straight through. But up at the North and South Pole, it has to go through more of a layer. Ho ho, math dad to the rescue. Thank you. So here we are at the equator and you can see that it just has to pass through the atmosphere. Okay. Like that one. But if we go up to a North or South Pole, now it has to travel through the atmosphere at an angle because the sun does not shine on the North Pole from directly above the North Pole. The sun shines on the North Pole from the side. And so the sunlight is traveling through more air. And that means that some of that sunlight is going to be absorbed or reflected away and not as much heat is going to hit the poles. Oh, ooh, ooh. I know a cool fact about this. Actually, this is what causes the sky, the sunset. So the sky is usually blue because you've got uh, the blue light has a really short wavelength. It's more likely to collide with particles and it will scatter. So what we're seeing is the scattered blue light uh, up in, in the sky. So it's actually it's being redirected, rescattered. Re but at sunrise, the sun's so lower on the horizon that it's passing through much Way more, more air. atmosphere. And more the blue light scatters um, and it, to the point where it doesn't even reach our eyes. And the other wavelengths of light are, red. Are, are scattering just a little bit and they are reaching our yeah, eyes. Red makes it through. So for a sunset, you have to be all the way like down here. You're coming through way more air. Now I'm seeing lots of comments in the chat, questions about our tea bag experiment. So real quick, I wanna say two things. Number one, anytime you're doing anything with matches, you absolutely must have adult supervision. This, this one is pretty safe because the tea bag, by the time it lifts up, it's mostly just soot. It's just this tiny little bit of you know carbon particles. And then number two, you do have to have a tea bag that bends in half. One that's just square is not gonna work. It has to be one of the longer ones that actually bends in half. And then when you open it up, it is nice and long like that. Could you do it again, science mom? Sure. Yeah, let's, let, let's try this one more time. Uh oh, except I just flattened it. That's all right. All right, so you, you want kind of do you want to cylinder light it, it up? Yeah, I want to. I light it up and. Well, this, this is Matt well, Dad's reward for me spilling tea all over him. He gets to light the tea bag this time. All right. So there it goes. It's burning down. Hot air is rising because hot air always rises, and now the hot air is going to carry the tea bag up all the way to the ceiling. That's flowing to the far side of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, Matt Dad's gonna go run and catch it. The air at the equator is also getting heated up by the power of the sun. And more sunlight is hitting the equator, more heat is hitting the equator than any other area in our planet. And that heat causes water from the oceans to evaporate. And then that water is kind of carried up just like you saw the tea bag get carried up it, because warm air always rises. Is this what they call convection? So you get warm air rising? Yes, warm air rising and then moving out. Anytime that you have that movement of air kind of in a circle, that's called convection. And this is exactly what happens at the equator. The warm air rises up, but once it starts to rise up, something curious happens. Do you remember what happens to air if it has a lot of water and then it cools down? Is that when we'll get clouds? Yes, that is when we get clouds. And this experiment demonstration is so fun, I thought we should do it one more time. So this bottle right here has a tiny little bit of rubbing alcohol in it. And when we add a little bit of pressure, we are going to increase the temperature. So fix that in right there, Math Dad. All right. Interesting question in the chat. Do planes get a lot of friction as they go through clouds? There would definitely be a little more friction in a cloud than with outside a cloud. All right. Cloud in a bottle. Cloud in a bottle. And this cloud was formed because the air cooled slightly. And when the air is traveling from the equator up and it has all of that water in it from being around the ocean and from all that warmth and evaporation, you get massive cloud formation around the equator. And this is why if you look at our planet, there is a belt of rainforests all around. Oh, wait a so. minute. So I, I was noticing that 
So all around the equator, you have rainforests. You have an area where it rains every single day. And that is caused by all of that evaporation and then those clouds forming and those clouds dropping the water as they rise up and cool. So the, the equator is where you're seeing all this, this green. Yeah, stripe. there's a green band all the way around the world, all around the equator. But then if you go just a little bit farther north, a little bit farther south, what do you see? Ooh, you desert. You see desert. And we're going to learn why there is desert in just a moment. Let's go to the notes. Page 26 is where we are at in the notes. And we're going to draw and show you how that rising heat forms deserts. If the iPad works after getting spilled on, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> the iPad's just fine. Oh, sorry again, Math Dad. This is a good reminder for everybody to be careful and not rush when you're doing a science experiment. So here is a diagram showing you the temperature in Singapore, which is one of the warmest cities and closest cities to the equator. Wait, and that's almost like a horizontal line. It is pretty much a horizontal line. Singapore is warm year round. You are never going to want a sweater or a coat if, when you visit the city of Singapore because it's always going to be warm. But the North and South Pole, those are a lot colder. The North Pole during the wintertime when it's facing away from the sun is about negative 30 degrees. And in the summertime when it gets sun all the time, it only gets up to about zero degrees Celsius. Mm, but up to about freezing temperature. Up to about freezing. It's always cold. The Antarctica, on the other hand, the South Pole is way colder. And oh, that's wow. because Antarctica is isolated. It's surrounded by ocean and it's a massive, huge continent. And that current of ocean and air that goes around it actually keeps that cold air from meeting the other air of the planet a little bit. And it sort of insulates it and keeps it even colder. Whoa. So am I understanding this correctly? That the warmest temperatures down at the South Pole are near the the coldest temperatures that the North Pole is yes. experiencing so, on, on average here. Wow. On, on average. On average, it's going to be colder at the South Pole always than it is at the North Pole. It's poor penguins. Well, the penguins don't live at the South Pole. They live right by the ocean. Oh, okay. All right. So not, not quite as bad. Yeah. Th those poor researchers at the South Pole, they better have good coats. <laughs> <laughs> here is our drawing of a convection cell. So convection is our cool word of the day. When you have hot air rising or hot water rising, if it gets up high enough, it's going to start to cool and it's going to travel out. And with our planet, this zone right here, this is actually called the intertropical convergence zone, where you have all of this water form. And cool fact, intertropical convergence zone, they actually call it the itch. The itch zone or the, the itch? The itch. Some, some, people, some people do that, sort of like a slang term for it. I like it. And as the air travels out, once it gets to about 30 degrees latitude, then it sinks down. And that's where most of the deserts, the warm deserts on our planet, they're mostly located at 30 degrees latitude. Oh, let me check. Let me check you out here. Sir. Well, so. Oh. And Matt, Dad, maybe you should mm -hmm. tell the difference between latitude and longitude real quick. Oh, oh, that's a really good point. Thanks, Mom. So zero degrees latitude is the equator. So cut the globe right in half along its, its axis of rotation. And then latitude is a, a measure of the, the angle relative to the center of the Earth, or it's a measure of how far you're traveling north. So you start at zero degrees, and then you go up 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 75 degrees, and all the way up to the North Pole is 90 degrees north latitude. But, or similarly, we could go to the south latitude. So we start at zero and head down to the South Pole and all the way down to 90 degrees south latitude. So latitude is a measure of how far from the equator you, you are on the globe. And, and longitude you, is kind of like orange slices. It's going around like, where are you on the globe? And it's actually in reference to England, which is kind of funny to me because yep. equator is the center of the earth. And then it's like, well, is there an east pole? How do you measure where you are east and west? Well, it, it we go back to the first people who made world maps and they happened to live in England and they said, Greenwich, England, that shall be the center. <laughs> yep. So somehow the, the latitude seems to make a bigger difference in the weather 
than the longitude because most at the same latitude, you're going to be experiencing similar conditions, whereas at this, but the same longitude, it can change quite a bit as you travel north and south. Definitely, definitely. All right, so we will talk a lot more about the globe and things, but it's just important to understand. So with latitudes, we're talking about so measures of how far north and south we are from the equator. And the equator, where it's always rainy, and we have rain every single day from that intertropical convergence zone where we have all of that warm air rising and making clouds, and then the clouds are dropping their water. When it goes out at about 30 degrees, the air returns, and it returns dry. And that is where we get deserts. That's what's causing the desert is because they, they already dropped all their water. Yes. And the, the air had water when it got heated from the sun so much, but then that water was dropped in clouds. And as it travels north and south and then starts to return back down, we get deserts where there is hardly any rain. And almost all of the hot deserts in our planet are at 30 degrees. And this big cycle actually has a really cool name. It's the Hadley cell. And if we look at a map of the world on page 27, we can draw in arrows to show which way the air is moving. Okay, so so, so, so I just wanna make sure this is the, the equator across here. Yes, that is the equator. Okay. And then our Hadley cell, we have the air that is rising at the equator. And this is what drives the Hadley cell this rising air from all of the heat from the sun. And then it travels this way and is gonna sink back down once it once it gets to about 30 degrees. So it has to be a loop. Yeah, it has to the, be a loop. The, the arrows have to satisfy that loop condition. Yep. All right. yep, it's a loop going like this. This is a Hadley cell. And then at the North and South Pole, we have cold air sinking, both at the North Pole and at the South, South Pole. North Pole, South Pole. We have cold air sinking. And the middle cell, the feral cell, is caught in between the two. So that these big circling loops of air, the Hadley cell going like this, the feral cell going like this, and then the polar cell goes like that as well. So this is happening all across the all planet. All across the planet. But our planet spins. And this is where we're going to do our next little demonstration. So, Math Dad, this one will not be messy. No water. Uh, Although, I've, I've heard that before. I science, will say Mom. My, my mint tea turned out lovely. <laughs> I'm glad the sacrifice was worth it. <laughs> so, I have a little turntable here, and I'm going to spin it. And your challenge is to see if you can draw a line just straight down the plate from the top to the so, bottom. So straight from the top to the bottom. But I'm gonna spin it while you draw, and I wanna see if you can make it a straight line. You ready? Okay. All right, here it goes. Hmm, math dad, that was not a very straight line. Do you wanna try again? Something seems to have gone amiss here. Okay. All right, <laughs> different color, try again. All right, starting at the top, going straight down, go. What the? Again, it did not go straight. Let's try one more time, maybe. Maybe if I go faster, do you think that would help? Uh, or should I go slower? Uh, why don't you go really slow this time? Okay. Oh. Okay. Oh. Different color. New color. All right. So starting at the top and... Ooh, Ooh. I was closer Went to a straight line. Oh, closer. That's still that, pretty curved. That kind of looks like a tennis ball almost. <laughs> <laughs> Baseball stitching. Yeah, that's a little bit like baseball stitching. So we got closer, but we did not quite make it because that plate was curving. And if you remember that clip we showed you at the beginning where we were sitting on that merry-go-round and we were tossing tennis yeah. balls. We were trying to throw it straight towards the basket. And what we would see every single time is it was just curving off to the side. Or was it curving? Or were we moving and the ball was going straight, but we were moving? This is called the Coriolis effect. And anytime you have motion of spinning, you get this incredible effect where the wind and the currents, things that are traveling more or less in a straight line, they are going to curve. And this happens with the Hadley cell. So as air is rising from the equator and moving north or south to about 30 degrees and then falling, when it comes back to the equator, because the earth is spinning, that air curves and we get what are called the easterlies. Wait, 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 okay. The air curves? Or is it, is it the, the earth moves underneath it, which is a, the same effect you can, ultimately, right? You can think of it kind of that Because on, on the plate there, as I was dragging, I, I was just going pretty straight down, I thought. 
but the, the earth underneath me was moving. And you're saying that same effect is happening down in, in the Hadley cells. So this air is trying to do its path, but meanwhile, the earth is rotating underneath it. And so it's actually coming down in a different place. It is, it is. And Math Dad built a fun little Desmos activity for you guys where you can try this. All right. So here we go. We'll make it nice and big. And okay. so what we have here is is a circle. Actually, I can I can throw this into the chat. I think I have a link. Yep. So there's there's a link that we're putting in the chat. The link will be in the description too. Okay. So what you're seeing here is a view, say from the North Pole, and this line on the outside would be the equator. We've got the Earth spinning. Um, actually, I'm not sure which pole I'm at to, to get the right That's direction right. of spin Just... here. But all right. So if we spin the earth, well, we try to draw a straight line across. See that green dot trying to move straight across? Well, the green dot did move straight across. Let me go back. Let me go back. But the line curved. All right. So the green dot's going straight across. And oh, that's the same thing we just saw. Ooh. What if you try yeah. it faster? It even go backwards. Look at that. That's fancy. All right. You, you want to spin the earth faster. Yes. Okay. Spin faster. Okay. So we're going to try this. Spinning even faster. Oh. Oh. Whoa. We made a loop. Do one more. Do one more really fast. Okay. Even faster. So well, this would be an interesting effect. Let's see what happens here. Whee. Oh, no way. So that's a really weird path to, to go from the North Pole. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Sorry, what, what we if you're trying sorry. to draw a the, 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 line. the North Pole would be if we were smack dab in the center. But yeah, so if, if I were to try to go from the North Pole down to the equator, that's the path I would take. That's, that's because I'm spinning really fast, but you, you usually we're not spinning nearly so fast. We, we get a different shape. But so if you are on a surface that is curved and that is moving, then traveling in a straight line gets kind of weird because the surface is moving as you travel. Yeah. And this is why hurricanes and or tropical cyclones in the north of the equator, they spin counterclockwise. And if you're south of the equator, they spin clockwise. Now there is a myth ah. that says that if you live in Australia and you flush the toilet, it's going to spin one way going down the drain. But if you live in North America and flush the toilet, it's going to go the opposite way. It turns out a toilet bowl is too small for the Coriolis effect to dictate how it spins. How the water, you know, the, the jets that push the water in, how they move is going to make an even bigger difference. And so you can get toilets in both countries that spin the same direction. But for a hurricane, for something that is much larger, yes, they always spin one way in the north and another way in the south. All right, there is... I'm gonna answer a couple questions I saw in the chat really fast, and then we have one more demonstration. All right. All right, we have a good question. Why is it cold on top of mountains if hot air rises from Malcolm? And I'm glad you asked about this. So hot air does rise, but as air is rising up into the topper parts of the atmosphere, it expands. And as it expands, then it cools down. So remember our cloud in the bottle that we did with the rubbing alcohol in the bottle and putting up the pressure? As air expands, it's going to cool. Okay. And, and that, that's that a really is why, good question though. That is why air is cooler as you get up higher. And that's true throughout the whole entire troposphere. At the top of the troposphere, it is really, really cold always because the air is expanding and the pressure is dropping. And the Hadley cell that I showed you guys, that's all in the troposphere and the lower layer of the stratosphere. That's where that's happening. We're not going up into the mesosphere or the exosphere. It's all that rotation is in the lower one. I want to show one more video about convection and we're gonna do a quick little demonstration. Don't worry, Math Dad, this one, we're using hot water, but I'm not gonna pour it on you. I, I, I believe it when I see it, Science Mo. All right, so. So I have two beakers here. This beaker, we're, this little Erlenmeyer flask, we are going to fill with warm water. And I'm going to put in a couple drops of red food coloring does, so that you, we can see how that water behaves. Is the shape going to matter? Or you, it's just, just, you just happen to have two so, containers? Just for, just for fun. Any small containers will work. Any small containers. Okay. And then we are going to put warm water into this flask right here. Don't spill. Don't spill. Whew. And we will put ice cold water into the other one. No spilling. 
<laughs> and then very carefully and slowly, I'm going to lower both of these into this container. Ooh, and slowly. some of the water from the blue one will likely spill out as I put it in, but hopefully not too much. So you're trying not to disturb. Trying not to disturb the, the water. The water. Okay. Got you. All right. So we had water come out from, from both of them a little bit, but look at that red one. That red one with the warm water. Oh, it's totally rising it up. It looks kind of like a volcano compared to the blue one, right? It's angry. The red <laughs> is rising up because it is warm. And anytime you have warm water or warm air, you are going to get the warm water rising because it is less dense. So, so same, it works just like in air with, within water, you're saying? Yep, same same thing happens in air. If you have warm air, that warm air is gonna rise and then cold air tends to sink. But remember with air, it's a little different because as that warm air is rising, once it gets high enough, it's going to expand and then it actually cools as it expands. And that means we're going to get a loop. We're gonna get a convection loop. Ooh, so, so what I'm seeing here down bottom, it's totally blue. The, all the blue cold water sink to the bottom and all the red is totally staying at the top. It's it not, is. it's not mixing. It is. Let's, let's, I want to share another video and this one's a time lapse because these, these take a little bit of time. Here's one where I sped it up and you can see same thing. If we put some red food coloring into a tank and then there's a tiny little tea candle under it to provide some heat, all of that red is going to rise. That warm water is rising and kind of spreads out. And you can see that it almost looks like it would come down and form a loop, but we didn't quite have enough. If we add some ice cubes, then we can actually get a loop going. So here we have that warm, that warm red water is rising up. Actually, this one's yellow. Okay. And then I'm going to add a couple drops of blue so you can just kind of see the way that the water in the rest of the tank is. That's not doing much. Not doing too much. Watch what happens when I add ice cubes. Oh, you're going to put an ice cube on the, the blue? Okay, on both sides. So there go the ice cubes on one side, ice cubes on the other side. And now see how all that blue oh. water is pushing into the middle? Yeah, yeah. It, it's totally started moving there. Totally started to form a loop. And the convection loops, those are the main things that drive those winds on our planet. So you have the easterly winds around the equator, and then up north you have westerlies that go the other way, and those are all driven by differences in temperature and pressure. So this this Hadley cells, is it, is it going up? Yep, so is... that's, that's why we have a belt of rainforest around the equator, and then a belt of deserts at 30 degrees above and below. But, but but the easterlies, just so just so I'm clear, what, what was what's causing? It's it's, it's the Coriolis effect. It's the Coriolis As, effect. Okay, so the Earth is moving underneath it, and yep. And let's show show this picture in the notes real fast, and then we'll do our where in the world mystery. All right. So here we have our Hadley cell rotating, and the air is just spinning and spinning around. But because the Earth moves, then you get this effect where we have the easterly winds, and then here we have the Farrell cell. It goes a different direction and we get the westerlies. Gotcha. So those are the main wind patterns on our planet. Now, I know we went through that a little bit fast, but um, I just wanted to kind of introduce that idea that we have global weather patterns that happen because our Earth is round and our Earth spins. And just those two things, the Earth being round and the Earth spinning, cause these global patterns of wind to happen. And then We'll talk more about like the earth being on a tilt and some other things next next week when we talk about climate. But let's do our mystery. So Ooh. we have had several mysteries about an ancient ruin or uh, abandoned place that used to be occupied by people and now is not or is not occupied in the same way. And I have a tricky one for you today, Math Dad. See if okay. you can guess where this is. All right. This can't quite read it. Massive towers represent... Mount Meru, home of the gods. Pilgrims still visit and leave locks of hair for good fortune. This one's I a tricky no one. I have no idea what, where Mount Meru is, home of the gods, pilgrim. A place that people are still visiting, hoping for good luck. Ooh, Science puppy. This is, this is a tricky one. Oh, it's five. That, that, that word is five. Um, well, I don't know where this is, but I think if I look at the pictures, I can probably see which one has five towers, or at least I can narrow it down. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. So if you look at page 30 in the notes, that's where you will 
oops, find all the, the where in the world clues. So. And I'm just going to give you the answer, Math Dad. You ready for this? I need it. Uh, the answer is Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Wow. Okay. I had no idea. I never would have gotten that right. Now, if I show you, if I show you a picture, I think it might look familiar to you. Let's look at this little video clip. Ooh. This is a really popular site and some of the similar ruins for filming um, movies. There are probably a couple movies you've seen that have had this footage um, or a similar area in it. And the ruins and the size of Angkor Wat is just incredible. This was built in the middle of a tropical jungle that is located not too far away from the equator. And some of these buildings actually have large trees growing right on top of them because the climate is so warm. But even though it's <laughs> almost a thousand years old, it's still standing, which is pretty incredible. So that's our where in the world mystery. And now we have poll questions for you guys. Oh. So go to sciteitempool.com slash science mom slash live if you're watching us live or if you're watching the recording, remember that at our website, there's a link where you can participate in the polls too. All right. So we are going... Our first question is, why does it rain most of the year around the Earth's equator? And I want you to pick the best answer. What is the the main reason why we have rainforests all around the equator? All right. So the possible answers include so that the force of the Earth spinning moves most of the clouds to the equator. The heat from the sun causes the ocean to evaporate more around the equator, forming clouds. And large clouds are repelled from the North and South Pole due to magnetic forces. Mm. Which of those is the best answer? Ooh, water is a polar molecule, isn't it? Yes, although that's a. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, let's let's uh, find out. Sorry. Did you want me to give hints, Math Dad? No, no, sorry. I, I'll, I'll keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Love seeing the answers come in. So, what what is causing it to rain most of the year around the Earth's equator? Why why do we have the rainforest there? Because I'm, I'm kind of jealous that they get that much rain. We and... we we definitely live in the 30 degree desert zone. That's just true. Yeah, well, we're All right. higher than 30, we are 30 degrees, higher, but... but still in the desert. All right. and reveal. Maybe. Oh, no. We, have a... we lost the mouse. He found it. Heat from the sun is causing the ocean to evaporate more. Exactly. That is the driving force of all of the rain that is around the equator, and it's those clouds that are formed from the heat. Now, does the earth spinning move most of the clouds to the equator? No, although the earth spinning does create the easterlies, those winds around the equator, and... But that doesn't that doesn't push clouds to the equator. The clouds come from the heat and magnetism. That answer is just nonsense. All right, science mom, giving hints about other answers. <laughs> oh, All right, the trade winds are consistent easterly winds that circle the Earth around the equator. Is that true or false? Hmm. I may have totally given that answer away just barely. Sorry, math dad. It's all right. I mean, they, they need all the help they can get, Science Mom, because uh, otherwise, I mean, we, we all know that they, I, I think they would go down. You need all the help you can get, Math Dad. <laughs> yeah, you're just giving him some easier questions here. They, they, they've got to get warmed up. All right. All right. So I'm going to finish. And... Uh, did I say false? Oh, no. I, I didn't mark... put in the wrong answer. <laughs> it is true. And I think the reason why is because we were debating, should we say easterly or should we say westerly and try and make it a trick question? Either that or the default answer is always B. So I, I have to Whoops. change it. But okay. So the, the correct answer was A. You guys got it right. Do they get double points if you select the wrong answer? I think they do. Um. Well, you know, I, I'm already giving them a, such easy questions anyway. We don't need to give them extra points. All um, right. Convection is driven by, is it hot air rising and cold air sinking, or is it hot air sinking and cold air rising? This one's an easy one, too. Math Dad, you did easy questions this time. Ah, uh, we're just building them up before I crush them. That's that's what's happening, right, Kaladin? Isn't that right? We'll find out. We'll see if the next one's a tricky one. Yeah. You got, you've got to lure them into a false sense of security. <laughs> then they'll, they'll fall will be so much more epic. All right, next question. <laughs> All right, and the chat says that hot air rises and cold air sinks. This is true. Nicely next. done. Good job, yeah, next and question. Really, kudos for so many of you getting that right. We, we say this is easy, but 
I bet if we asked this to random people on the street, there's nowhere near this many people would be getting it right. And it's an important thing to know. It really is. All right, question four. What is latitude? Hmm. So we have longitude and latitude. Which one is which? Okay, so is it a measure of how far north and south we are from the equator, or is it a measure of how far east and west we are from Greenwich, England? All right, it's one of those. I'll, I'll even go so far as to tell you, yeah. Uh, what was it? One of them is essentially latitude, one of them is longitude, but which one, which one is, is which? latitude? Which one is latitude? Mm. Okay, so both categories are getting some votes. So I've either stumped like a third of them or two thirds of them here. Let's see which one it is. All right, finish and reveal. The measure of how far north and south we are from the equator, that, that is correct. That's what latitude is measuring. So at the equator, you've got zero degrees latitude. And as you travel north, you go up to 15 degrees north latitude, 30 degrees north latitude, and just keeps going up to 90 degrees north latitude. Would That's be the North Pole. North Pole. And as you head down from the equator, you get 15 degrees south latitude, 30 degrees south latitude, all the way down to 90 degrees south latitude would be the South Pole. Well done. Okay. Next question. Is it going to be a hard one, Math Dad? Uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll mm -hmm. see. What happens to the rising air that is heated at the Earth's equator? It rises to the top of the atmosphere and escapes into outer space. It rises to the top of the troposphere and travels to the north or south pole before sinking. Or it rises to the top of the troposphere and travels to 30 degrees latitude before sinking. One of those is accurate. Which one will it be? I see a bar that's going all the way past your head, Math Dad. Oh, but I was That means winning. your defeat is imminent. No, 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 no. All three of them had some votes. They... So th this this natural like competitive aspect that Math Dad has to his personality, it turns out I think this is a dominant gene because <laughs> all three of our kids really have it. And so when we play games, it's really kind of funny the amount of like, ooh, I'm going to win you. No, I'm going to win. The amount of trash talk that happens is through the roof. All right. But and we have a good time. We, we do. And they said that it rises to the top of the troposphere, travels to the 30 degrees latitude before sinking. <gasps> that is correct. Good job, undefeatable science kids. Nice, nicely done. Now, I mean, it's not so hard to get the answer right on the day of. I mean, they, they, they did pretty well. But on Friday, that's we when have... the real test is going to arrive because it's a quiz show day. It is a quiz show day. And if you go just to the next pages of the pages that we we're on today, 28 and 29, we have a practice quiz for you to help you get ready. The questions that are on the practice quiz are not going to be the same as the questions we have Friday. We Maybe. hope that you will give it a try and prepare so that you can defeat Math Dad. Yeah, because that's the real test. Like, do you know on days when we haven't been talking about it, did you actually remember these ideas? And I mean, don't don't feel bad if you get crushed. I just want you to, to adjust your expectations, you guys, because the undefeatable science kids in the chat are asking about the defeat dance, and I think we should do the first suggestion that we see. Oh, ready for this, Math Dad? So suggest I, a dance in the chat, and Math Dad will do it for the defeat <laughs> dance. I, I don't know any dances. I hope hopefully it's one you know. <laughs> you got it's, fingers, it's a pretty short list. Fingers crossed yeah. that it's the chicken floss, right? What do you think, Kaladin? What do you think? Kaladin's like, what, what? Poggers dance. Oh, oh she chicken floss. I see chicken floss. Oh, I, yeah, I, I don't know what the poggers dance is, but okay, I can pretend to do the chicken floss. We've got chicken, chicken, floss, floss. <laughs> there we go. That is Math Dad's <sighs> defeat dance in honor of the undefeatable science kids who got all the questions right. And on Friday, we are going to have a game show review or like an earth science quiz show where we have 20 questions for you. So come ready for that on Friday. I want to give a special happy birthday today to Runa, who turned six today. Happy birthday, Runa. Hey, Runa. And to Keen, who turned 11 last Friday. Happy birthday, Keen. And now if we have, we have time, I'm going to answer just a couple questions from the chat. So Pickle Obsessed asks, asks a great question. What would happen if the world stopped spinning? I want to first say this Whoa. is scientifically impossible. Um, <laughs> but if the Earth did suddenly stop spinning, where the Earth itself, the solid mass that we are on, just completely stopped, it would actually be like a 
more than a level five hurricane instantly worldwide because the air would not stop spinning. Oh. If you stopped the earth and the air spinning at the same time, then we would have one side of the planet that would get very, very warm and hot and the other side that would be dark all the time. And eventually that would cause some interesting and catastrophic effects to our climate. But if the earth itself just stopped spinning and the air didn't, it would actually knock down every building on the planet within a matter of seconds. Oh man. Because the earth is spinning really, really fast. If you think of, if you think about it, that's the speed with which the air and the planet rotate is quite a force to reckon with. Oh yeah. Really interesting question there. And then he has been asked, why did the food dye do a loop? This is a good question. And it's because of convection. When you have warm air or warm water rising, okay. if you don't have cold air also or cold water also sinking, then you can get layers. And in fact, let's go to this other camera view and show them the layers we created today. So right now in our, in our experiment here, the blue water is still inside this beaker. In fact, let me scoot it over so you can see it still has blue water in it. But our Erlenmeyer flask is pretty much empty now because all of the red water that was warm went out and made a layer in the top of our container. That's but in the time lapse that I showed you where I put ice cubes on the side, I was trying to show convection. So if we have warm air rising up on one area and then cold ice cubes on the other area, we can actually make a cell, a convection cell, just like the Hadley cell that happens on our planet. So it's that combination when you've got warm air down here and cold air up here, you're going to get a current. Yeah. Yep, you're going to get a current. So good question, Yasmin. And let me look real quick. Um, ooh, Arrow Skier asks a good question about whirlpools and the direction they go. So, and again, this is about the, the Coriolis effect. There is a myth that toilets will flush one direction differently, depending on if you're above or south of the equator. And um, there, you, can, you can look up, there's a great, um, I'll put a link in the description to a good video that goes into a lot more detail than we have time for and busts that myth and then shows you what happens at the equator. But the but the storms, the hurricanes do, do follow that trend. Yes, storms do follow that trend, hurricanes and um, typhoons. They definitely spin a different direction north and a different direction south. At the equator themselves, do you remember math, Dad? I used to know, right well, now, I don't remember. I'd have to look it up. As to whether it would spin a different direction? Well, it'd be hard to say. Huh, I wonder if that would mess with the storm if it traveled across the equator. Ah, that's a really interesting question, you guys. Yeah, that is a good question. All right, one more, one more question. How did the cells, the Hadley cell, the feral cell, and the polar cells get their name? It makes sense that the North and South Pole are the have polar in their name, but what about the other ones? And this is from um, Crazy Wizard. Good question. That um, is, they're named after the scientists who discovered them. So Hadley, a person who had the last name of Hadley, was the scientist that we credit with discovering the Hadley cell. And then Farrell is the last name of a scientist who also did a lot of research into atmosphere and weather and they named that other cell after him. All right, we are um, out of time, so we've got to run, but thank you so much for joining us, you guys, today. And I gotta say, um, live shows don't always go quite as we plan, right, Math Dad? No, they, they sure don't. <laughs> so thank you for joining us and for being patient when we have little hiccups, like accidentally spilling tea on Math Dad. Sorry about that. It's always a mess. <laughs> Work hard, grow smart, and we will see you on 